The Ensemble podcast is intended for professional financial advisors. All discussion is limited to publicly available information and should not be interpreted as legal, professional or financial advice. Ensemble does not hold an AFS licence nor provide any financial services. Before making investment decisions, you should obtain financial advice from a qualified financial advisor. G'day, Clayton here from Ensemble. Thanks for joining me for this podcast. It's a pleasure to be able to do this from time to time. Hopefully you enjoy. If you're not already on Ensemble, please go to Ensemble.com or find us in the App Store. This podcast is proudly sponsored by NetWealth. Imagine a world where you can offer clients access to local and international investments. A world where you can engage with clients meaningfully, backed by powerful data and insights with mobile-friendly technology. A world where you can build business efficiencies through scaled managed accounts and bulk reporting. And a world where you can get all the latest news, research and insights to spot the changes that really matter. Wealth is more than just money. It's about opportunity and progress. A world of opportunity awaits you at netwealth.com.au forward slash woo. Jedi Clayton here from Ensemble today chatting with Chris Booth, better known as Boothy. Mate, how's it going? I'm very well. Clayton from Ensemble. And I'm <laughs> Boothy here. Happy to be here. <laughs> yeah. Well, so we're in the discussion of, you know, potentially launching a, uh, a podcast dedicated to financial planners to get their head around property and debt and all those good things. Um, and sort of as we were discussing it and I was getting my head around how, you know, how knowledgeable you are in this area, including we just spent the last five minutes going through my own personal situation. What I thought would be a great sort of introduction to the listeners of the Ensemble podcast, um, would be a bit about your background, uh, and sort of how you came to be one of the co-owners and, and CEO of Lydian. Um, and you know, your experience working with financial planners, um, basically if we, if we fast forward six to 12 months from here and you're on, you know, on a weekly episode, educating financial planners about how to work with debt and property, let's set you up in terms of, you know, why advisors are going to listen to you in the first place. And I know your background and, and I share an office with you and I get to see how, how busy you are, but um, I think it'd be really interesting for to go through a bit of your history and uh, and what brings us here today in this fabulous office we have here at yeah. 75 Pitt Street. Yeah, it's cracking, isn't it? No, I love it. Level four. Come on down. <laughs> so, um, so, mate, talk us through when did you first get into... This whole property and mortgage space. Well, so my first stepping stone into, I suppose, banking and finance to do home loans, which is kind of part and parcel of what we're talking about now, is when I was about sort of 30 years old, joined the Commonwealth Bank. So I just recently uh, left the Bank of China, which was an interesting conversation, but that's probably for a different... Oh, no, no, no. We're not... (laughs) (laughs) Talk to me about the Bank of China. What on earth were you doing there? Well... So my when I first came to Australia, my old previous job was in um, the Isle of Man at the Royal Bank of Scotland where I was involved in treasury. So foreign exchange, money markets, all that kind of stuff, right? And I was really, really buzzed to be involved in, you know, that, that sort of treasury stuff. It's quite sexy, you know, mm. read the Fin Review or whatever it would be. And yeah. it's quite interesting. And then I did my courses uh, subsequent to learn more about markets. So I've always been fascinated how, how markets uh, say they, um, you know, they're, they're compliant and they're regulated and things, but how unregulated when you're at the granular hockey here they are. Anyway, um came to Australia, had no job, um looking for a, a you know a treasury job. And the, the the job that popped up was for the Bank of China. So um at the office in York Street, opposite the Occidental, so top HQ oh, best place. Absolutely. Um yes, yeah, started my journey as a, a foreign exchange person here in Australia, which was trading. Yeah, so my wow. job was basically just managing the the books, uh, the, the to balance the books out. So, um, so interestingly, uh, we've got what's called the eleven AM cash. So you know that they can't close the books at night with a, a a shortfall on their books. So I go out and borrow that money into bank just to cover those books and make sure we're we're positive. Now, is that called LIBOR overnight? So LIBOR and- is the interest rates with which determines int- like 
interest rates in the UK, LIBOR. Right. Okay. LIBOR, LIBID. Yep. And then in Australia, we've got our bank bill swap rates, which cover sort of that equivalent. Yeah. Got kind of, it. Okay. Yeah. Cool. And then there's this, this, you've got your, your swap rates over here as well. But anyway, I mean, look, I mean, this is a long time ago, so things may have changed. But yeah, so one, I would cover the, the interbank money. So if we were short, we'd borrow money from, say, NAB or CBA just to cover the books. Yeah, right. Alternatively, if we were holding more cash than um, than we needed, we'd then lend it out to the marketplace as well. So go to NAB, CBA, whoever needed it, and lend them that as well. So that was quite cool. The other thing I did was foreign exchange. So we had a lot of Chinese um, businesses, so people... Uh, importing or exporting i mean that's tradition um and yeah so i'd cover their foreign exchange exposure and then make sure that our books were balanced as well and then lastly i had to proprietary trade as well and that proprietary trading means you're basically having a punt on the markets and we weren't we weren't restricted in that job to just fx or uh, money market stuff we could sort of go out and explore other avenues of investments as well so and this is only your 20s Late, yeah, late, late twenties. Yeah, so you're running riot with the Bank of China checkbook in your late twenties. That I mean, there's a lot of drunk stories. I'm sure I could tell you. <laughs> I, I remember shutting down the, pretty much shutting down the money market um, platform for uh, the Aussie Cash because the People's Bank of China had liquidated all of their bonds, um, and like we had no way billions of dollars on our account. Liquid, liquidated their Aussie bonds? Yes, yeah, so their Aussie bonds. Oh, so this when is, was this? This was um, just before the Aussie dollar hit the all-time low. Oh, sorry, just after the Aussie dollar hit the all-time low. I think we're down at 48 cents. And, wow. Um, and the, the Chinese, they kind of gave up on holding Australian assets because of that foreign exchange loss they'd made. So they liquidated all at that sort of 55 cents. And then we had kept, because we were their clearance house for them. So overnight, they'd gone and sold all their bonds, and it was it was um, treasury and state. So, you know, we, we got a lot of cash on the on the account. Um, <laughs> and it was, it was billions of dollars. And I didn't have the uh, appropriate lines to actually lend it out. Enough money, I didn't have enough limits to lend out to the local bank network. So I lent out the money I'd, I could, which was which basically scratched the niche. Um, and then I closed my book, you know, because I'm thinking, well, what, what do I do now? Just leave it there. Well, um, I think at sort of 2 o'clock, 2.30, as things are getting pretty interesting, I get a lot of calls from a lot of um, people. It's a.m. 2 a.m. No, no, p.m. Oh, okay. It closes in the afternoon, yeah. Oh, right, right, right. And, um, and uh, they're going, you know, why are you holding on to all this gas? And I'm going, well, I've got no more lines to lend out. <laughs> so I got a dirty call from quite a senior person at the Reserve Bank of Australia, and I'm sort of 28, I'm taking this terrible call and I'm, I'm going, mate, the Chinese won't lend it to the, the government, to the RBA. And he's going, you have to sort this out. <laughs> so I'm on the telephone to the Chinese people kind of going, well, guys, you know, look, it's, it's the Reserve Bank of Australia. They're pretty, you know, they're pretty stable. We should be kind of, you know, we've got to lend this money just to, okay. So, uh, that, I mean, look, that was fascinating. But that, that and many other sort of trading stories, because we, you know, we were dealing with, all the investment banks as well, so Goldman's, uh, City, yeah. um, Solomon's, um, you know, JB Weir and stuff like that. You know, yeah, it's, yeah. it's cool, you know, that a is lot. cool, man. So, so you, 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 you're in higher finance, and then, mate, what's going on? Then you start dealing with home life. Yeah, so I thought, well, I mean, the, my fascination with markets was was one thing, but then um, I, I actually you know, felt that it was appropriate at that time to try to study to be a financial planner. That is kind of one of the things I wanted to do. Yes. And then um, through the application process of a, f- a few banks and things or you know, researching, CBA popped up. They were part of the Comsec division at the time. So Comsec being their investment side of their banking business. Yep. Um, so the job was to basically be a relationship manager for their mid-wealth clientele. So what I mean by that is you know, you've got your private banks with your sort of two, three million dollars of you know assets or more. Mm-hmm. These are clients who are sort of living in the eastern suburbs, maybe borrowing one million dollars to two million dollars and stuff. You know, but big houses and plenty of money on their accounts. So CBA basically sponsored me into learning about home loans, and they've got a fantastic sort of program to learn and develop. I mean, obviously, I mean CBA, yeah, uh, plenty of clients. They carved out their Bondi Junction book. Um, for us, so the high net wealth individuals in the Bondi Junction, Eastern Suburbs area to speak to, which was great. So overnight, I had like 400 clients in a pretty oh. top demographic. Excellent. Um, never written a home loan before in my life, right? So this, I'm learning on, learning on. You're, right, you're, you're on the front of the RBA. All right, I've got this 5.6 interest rate. <laughs> and, then, and then the other part of uh, Comsec, and I'm not saying this is good or bad, but um, Comsec were underwriting a lot of their 
product, you know, their own um, mm-hmm. product. So we had, you know, the Pacific Brands, the Pearls offers, the Mitch and France and Bridges is way back yeah, um, a long time ago. So as part of my job also, I was able to go out um, under a non-advised sort of program and offer these, um, I suppose, initial public offering, offerings, IPOs, oh, right. um, to clients. Um, I think was, we did 452 Capital as well, so some some funds and stuff. But yeah, so I got to sort of continue doing the investment stuff and then learn about, I suppose, more of mums and dads banking. Yeah, mate. And then a number of years at CBA. Yeah. Is there any step between there and how you end up working with our chairman, Roxy? Yeah, so, well, um, the, the journey was... I, I, you know, very good at relationship management, talking to people, finding out about their sort of needs and wants, learning at the same time the product being debt, you know, home loans and how that works and things. Uh, I suppose I got to that sort of saturation level of only, you know, knowing home loans and investment loans and was starting to get fascinated about business loans and, and, and things like that. So I stepped up into the corporate world, started doing lending to businesses, which I found uh, very right. interesting, yeah. Because obviously the uh, the type of assessment you go through for business is very different to a home loan. So you really got to go down to the granular sort of risk elements of you know why you're lending, what you're lending, what the recourse is, and things like that. So your story gets much much bigger, and I, I, I quite like that. Yeah, and that learning was really good for me as well. And then that that kind of led me into from Combank to St George Bank. I specialised in then lending money to. Um, any business which is going concerned, so lawyers, accountants, um, financial planners, mortgage brokers, real estate agents, right, um, against their recurring revenue, yes, assets, yeah, right. And then I had a portfolio of those guys, which Roxy um, back then, um, he was looking to buy out his business partner, so I met him through that. No way, you met you met Rox through a transaction. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I was helping him to try to sort of separate from his. Previous business owner, take yeah. the business forward. Yeah, um, you know the new iteration with these new partners. Yes, um, yeah, and um, yeah, and that's so interesting. He, uh, the amount of times I've heard uh, people meeting Roxy through a commercial transaction that end up working with him later is is super high. So, I mean, through this through this network of clients, which I did look after. I mean, there's some fantastic financial planners back there, right? Yeah, but what I found going out to the main was that they were all hunting for clients who got the large from under management that they yep. could then charge appropriate sure. for. Yep. Now, th- there's a fantastic relationship they had, but the pricing was was basically predicated by the you know amount of money invested back then, right? Yes. What I found really um, interesting about Roxy's model and the announced model was they weren't looking at high net wealth individuals. They weren't looking at high fund balances. They were taking a fee for service from a very early age when fee for service was pretty much that's right. Like, how can you do this? How can you charge your clients a fee? They weren't yeah. taking it from platform. Yep. Um, and last, they had s- such a large portfolio of accumulated clients. You know, yeah. so really different. They were they were making their money from a large audience. And also, he was one of the first to get into the property and debt environment as well as, as making it a part of the financial planning process. Yeah. Well, I mean, yeah, again, so there was others out there who did it. But yep. Again, not as large an audience. Yeah. Um, and secondly, I don't think it was, it was, wasn't um, sort of an integrated approach. Yeah. Um, too. But, okay, you know, I, th- I think the learning years which I had both in, you know, the treasury one at Bank of China, the CBA days were, were pretty great, you know, learning the debt craft from scratch. And they also also sponsored me and put me through DFB 128, which I know back then was the, the qualification to be a financial plan. I know it's short of the mark today, yep. but, you know, it gave me that backbone of understanding the other, other elements of a client's wealth yeah. creation plan, also protecting a client as well. Yeah. Um, and, and, and again, you know, I tried to live those values myself with the relationships I've got either in the bank or more, more formally later in announcing, you know. Yeah, mate, that's a uh, that's a long journey. It see it seems like it feels long because you don't look particularly old. But, but but when you really break it down, you're about seventy or eighty years of age. <laughs> <laughs> the the grace, yeah. You know, so so again, right? So if I go back through that story, I'll, I'll, I've always been wanting to learn. And, yeah. And, but before before I take a, a, a risky step, as it were, being either self-employed or, or not, and that's talking about, you know, why Lydian today, yeah. I felt I had to learn my craft before I could actually take that next step. So, you know, if I go back, you know, to be, a, I always was always fascinated with becoming a mortgage broker, but, you know, husband, wife, three kids, financial obligations at home, it's difficult to do that because, yeah. you, you know, you're risking everything. So 
Roxy gave me that halfway house to learn how to be a broker, which was really, really kind of him at the time to do it. Yeah, so you basically um, built a, a quasi-business out of... Uh, that was a part of the announcer group. Yeah, so we built a business within the business, yeah. Yeah, that's and, cool. And so, you know, there's a sponsorship of some salary in there. But from day one, I did want to become a partner of the business. Yep. Also be a voice of, you know, the, the direction of the business as well. Yeah. Um, and also, you know, seeing all of these different businesses in my life as well, I've always been fascinated about how people uh, build a business. Yeah. And how people build a good business. Yes. And what the kind, kind of the elements from a, I don't know, a, a melting pot need to be in that business. So yep. having a seat at the table with, you know, six or seven other partners that announced it gave me the ability to, one, have a voice, two, learn a lot, three, understand financials again at that company level, yep. four, you know, figure out cash flow, hiring, firing, yes. offices, yep. fit outs, all of that kind of stuff, you know? Yeah. Well, I mean, all business is uh, marketing, the better your marketing, uh, the easier your sales, uh, the more sales, uh, the more operations, operations, delivery, delivery outcome, outcome, how happy the client is. It's, yeah. it's, it's this sort of linear process. And the better you are at each of those steps, um, the more likely you are to, to grow the, the piece of the pie. So, um, when I look at what you guys are doing at Lydian, it's a very interesting model, right? Because you're, you're working with a lot of different brokers. Um, you also have some amazing referral partners like HR Block, for example. Mm. Um, and it, certainly, while it's a brand new company in the sense that it's about two years old, or take correct, yeah, it looks like it's much older <laughs> because each of those steps. If I, if I think about to my own entrepreneur journey, I was the complete opposite of you. You you, you figured out exactly how to do it before you started. I had no idea what I was doing when I started. <laughs> Thank God that's over a decade ago now. But uh, yeah, the, the the systems and processes you have in place are super top notch, right? And 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 I mean, because we were in the Philippines at the same time seeing our staff over there, and your team was quite large compared to ours. And uh, the Jackie, I know you work with um, Jackie, who handles a lot of your sort of interim steps on where the clients are and, and making sure that they get looked after. And, a lot of your processes um, and your delivery in general and operations are super good. That, that's that been kind of the huge standout for me. Um, what would you say in terms of working with financial planners, specifically in your announcer days, did you learn that, you, that you're now taking into the Lydian company? Because a huge part of what you're doing here at Lydian is, is creating a service that allows financial planners to increase what it is that they deliver to their clients or increase increase the share of wallet, if you uh, use that terminology, um, and you're making sure that those clients are well looked after, mm. which is, if I think back to my own financial planning days, that was what I was looking for. I was looking for how do I increase the share of wallet that my office takes care of, right, but without losing sort of that best of breed uh, at, at touch points along the way. So what did you learn at Announcer that allows you to sort of bring everything that you learned there into Lydian to help with financial planning clients? Yes. Yeah, so again, um, firstly, I, my knowledge around relationships, and certainly for me, it's all about relationship, the client first, okay? So at Announcer, the financial planners have, and all financial planners have a really deep um, emotive and financial relationship with clients, I think, which is important. Okay, so that in itself is for me is is the standout. Secondly, I know how fin how hard it is for a financial planner to one uh, recruit a new client and build that trust and empathy, and yeah, um, you know, and their service proposition has got to fit that client, but also retain it. Now, you know, the you know, to charge an annual fee for a client to have that relationship is you know is quite bold too. So, yeah. but to, you know, for me particularly, I respect the industry that they're in and how hard they work for their clients. Okay. For me, I'm quite a lazy mortgage broker per se because <laughs> I'm relying on you know one that the, the you know that relationship is super super strong with that planet. Two, because they're providing that sort of um, wealth creation advice, they've got all of the fact find details, you know, income assets, liabilities down. So yep. for me, running onto a conversation around finding an appropriate product to to uh, meet the needs and objectives that the financial planner is uh, providing 
is very, very easy, right? So, and hence uh, sort of this partnership. But I've always worked really well with financial planners because one, I respect that advice piece. So I'm not going to do anything or recommend anything which is outside of the scope of that advice initially. Two, I recognize my position as being a person sort of um, participating not only in the transaction, but that long journey of the relationship as well. So when you're talking about touch points, a client may come in this year and they'd have nothing to do from a, 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 an advice perspective, but a simple review of their debt being interest rates, equity, affordability might be appropriate. And it gives them value through that conversation. So I think plugging in a debt conversation is important, especially for you know the accumulators, mm. but certainly uh, today, when clients are getting to that sort of 55, 60 years old and still carrying debt, and, um, you know, there'll still be wealthy clients, but investment debt, yep. um, it's appropriate to review that too. So the, the, the model we have is all about sort of um, be, being integrated into that advice process, but being secondary to so, yeah, delivering the advice. And just, and, and from what I understand, Lydia, do you guys use X plan? So we we don't, but what we what we like to do is collect data from Xplan, which is the base fact find information. Yeah, we are looking at trying to um, integrate data from Xplan. Well, how, how do you send? How do you send? So let's say I'm a financial planner. Let's say I've got 100 clients. <clears throat> let's say 20 of those clients have um, debt uh, with Lydian, you know, through Lydian. Yep, as the broker. So you're saying you would send over an annual piece of information for me to use with that client in my annual review. Yeah. And how, that's awesome. So how would you send it across if you're not using X plans? Do you just send it across in a PDF or? Pretty much, yeah. So we've got, we've got a review document, which we use, which is PDF. Um, obviously we've got all the privacy obligations in place for the, you know, the two way relationship. Yep. Um, yeah. So we give a, a PDF over, which basically has current um, debt to income ratio, current loan to value ratio, you know, so that's what equity is in there, the strength of the interest rate appropriate to um, other lenders. Yeah. And lastly, the uh, score of, um, you know, your credit score. So you have Equifax or your um, like VEDA or whatever it was called. Right, right. Yeah. And then let's go through the different ways because we've spoken about it separately, but there's, I think, two ways or, or maybe there's just one that you're focusing on in on, but either, either way, like let's say I'm a financial planner, right? Let's say I might have a credit license just because of the qualifications that you do as a financial planner, but I certainly have never done mortgage before, right? So, um, so let's say I I want let's say twenty percent of my clients uh, and the need for either refinancing or buying a property, and I want to work with you guys. How do you how what is the system that you do in terms of upfront and ongoing commissions and that kind of thing and and what work is required from me? Sure. So look, we, we believe that the you know the best relationships that want where the financial planner or the financial planner's business is participating in that transaction with us. Cool. Um, so initially, you know, collecting that fact, the, the initial fact find or an old fact find is important to us. And therefore, some of the work has been provided by the financial planner. So we're happy to pay for that sure. initial relationship. And as we're doing, a, you know, if we're implementing a review as well in, in tandem with the financial planner's review, well, therefore, we've got trail commission in mortgages. Therefore, we can pay. We feel it's appropriate to pay trail commission. If, again, the financial planner is integrating this uh, this product and service conversation at the review. Oh, right. Yeah. So, so if the financial planner includes the uh, property as a part of their integrated financial plan, yep. then there is an ongoing fee that they can receive as well. So we, we're happy to pay upfront and trail commission to right. build a bit of an annuity stream right. and, and sort of complement the relationship that we've got. Right. If for, I mean, we, we know we've got clients, financial planning clients who don't want to receive an upfront income or don't want to receive any income from our sure. services, yep. um, we offer a rebate to the client. So the client gets a financial benefit for the relationship, right? Okay, and that is reflected well at the financial planners, uh, right? So, the, so, so the option is, uh, if if the advisor is happy to take a a commission, then they can. Yep. And if the advisor uh, doesn't want the commission, then they can have it. Correct. Really to see the client. The to the client. Yep. Super interesting. Yeah, I love it when. Um, I think back to my insurance days. I I would love it when clients came to me. Um, and they already have something in place. And when they came across to me, I'd just call the provider and say, hey, can you please take off the inbuilt commission that's in there? Oh, yeah, yeah. And, and all of a sudden, the clients are like, gets an immediate reduction in what they were paying previously 
um, because I was I didn't start out as fee for service. I started out just as very traditional um, financial planning uh, business, uh, and then sort of over the space of uh, I've built up the company over about four years. By the last year, I was doing my best to to do everything as fee for service as possible. Yeah, sure. But with that said, I've seen fantastic companies only work in the commission space and fantastic companies that only work in the fee only space and the combination yeah i i i I think a long time ago i gave up on the concept that there was only one right way to receive a revenue i think i think it's hard to move to entirely fee um like psychologically yeah but when you do i think that you can actually make more money. I like if I, yeah. if I look at the, the bigger practices, it's the ones that that say, "Hey, what? Like, why would I use a product provider to earn my revenue? Why wouldn't?" Uh, at the same time, it's obviously it's it is. I feel uh, psychologically easier to not have to charge a large fees. So, as uh, yeah, a long time ago, I gave up on the concept that there was one right way. I think, well, I think all ways are a possibility, and it's awesome that you're providing that as an option. Well, I think I think and that's something we've we've you know done with the platform we've got in place. You mentioned before our operations team. So we we can't account for the broker's time because we don't have the systems to do that. But interestingly, what do you mean by that? Well, so, you know, how long do they spend on the telephone call with sure. clients? How long do they spend yes. supporting the process of the home loan? Yep. What time did it take to actually write the advice? So all of those things because our mortgage brokers are independent and we don't control their sort of sure. Um, yes, you know, we don't bill for we don't log in a bill for time. Yep. Having said that, from an operations perspective, our guys in the Philippines they use a software called TimeCamp, yep. and everything that they do on behalf of the client, right. uh, they register the incremental time it takes to actually do the loan process. Interesting. So, um, it when I first started, Lydia and I actually bumped into, or oh, sorry, I got um, a referral to speak to Paul Heath at Coda Capital. Ah, so Paul, uh, well, my best friend David Knowles works at Coda, and he got right. helped. You know, Paul set up a code of capital. It was, you know, on the back of an envelope. His big thing was, you know, uh, dealing with, um, you know, non-conflicted remuneration, yes. importantly, and building like a high net wealth space. So yes. I'm sure there's a lot more to it, right? But anyway, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but I sat down with Paul, and one of the things he said to me was that if you can, if you can actually physically demonstrate the time it takes to service your clients, yes, um, and then um, appropriately charge a fee or collect uh, commissions which service your client. Then you're in, you know, you're in that sort of hybrid fee for service space. Yeah. So that's what we're trying to do now. So every time we have a transaction, um, we actually measure how long it took to actually serve from an operations perspective. Yep. That client. Now we get complicated ones, we get good ones, but the average time per file operationally to do you know, end-to-end is about ten hours. Some blow out to even more. Right. So if you think about that from you know the cost of, to to service your clients, if we can at some point in the future share with the client how hard it is to actually do. The transaction, also share with the financial planners or the other partners that we've got how long it takes to do the transaction. Then we'll get a bit more. Um, yeah, I think the commercialities of the agreements will be much more robust and and stronger. Um, interestingly, people think a, a traditional, straightforward home loan is really simple. <laughs> well, I do because I've never done one. So to me, um, you know, you, you see these kind of these these app platforms that are out there. They, you know, they. Yeah. Have you, they give you thirty seconds, and you get a loan or something or other, right? So, I, but I don't know what that means. I I don't know if it's real. Or realistically, if for, from this side of the fence, we when you've never done it before, you, you don't know. Yeah. Well, I said, look, look again. There are many clients who are in that sweet spot whereby they've got strong income, um, and I'm just talking about their base income. They've got a low loan to value ratio with a prime asset being a you know a, a city metro property yep um and to demonstrate both uh to to, to demonstrate uh, the valuation of the property we can do an rp data no problems yep and to evidence income we can just look at the deposits in an account as a salary yep um, and that that's no problems at all to, to service the debt and there's very few clients who, who actually fit that model right i'd say sort of 20 25 percent of clients would yeah um and therefore that's why we're getting this this digital transaction today so, um, and with open banking, which you know, is, is being allowed now, but also it's being adopted now from a, a mortgage broking perspective, yep. we're in that sort of um, space now where ultimately 
the clients. So right now we make a recommendation of three products, okay? But then we've still got to go through the application process, yeah? Right. But we're in that space now whereby that we could actually um, build the fact find and, and evidence the, you know, the, the income and things and also then actually have a, almost approval for three products and then push through to settle with the product rather than uh, recommend and then approve. Does that make sense? Yeah. And what is this recommendation piece new? But I didn't realize mortgage brokers actually did that. No. So we so every time we actually uh, recommend a product, we've actually got to discuss who we've considered on our panel. Yes. Why we've excluded them. Right. The features of the product we're recommending and why those features were appropriate. Right. The interest rate component and the repayment components of the loan. Yes. And lastly, why we chose the lender. Uh, um, but typically, we've got to compare that with two of the prime products, which they the client. Would have been why, why would why would anyone ever recommend or accept something other than the cheapest? Oh, so I mean, well, okay, there might be some features like let's say uh, an offset account. So, assuming an offset account exists, yep, why wouldn't you just pick the cheapest? So, always, I mean, the, the primary focus was is price, yeah, that's yeah, hundred percent. But then, um, like I said before, there's a lot of clients who fall outside of. St- standard credit policy therefore we're looking for nuances with regards affordability right. um, how the banks assess commissions bonuses potentially will they accept the the property so we've got a lot of high density properties in in sydney in particular so some lenders don't like to do that others yeah. do yeah we've got um for first home buyers with lenders mortgage insurance premiums there's a big difference between the premiums you pay for a lenders mortgage insurance so in-house products are, are typically um, right. a, a bit more expensive. Then we've got Genworth and um, QBE um, and others as well. So we've got that price as well to, right. to consider. So there's a, a, you know, like fundamentally we're always going for best price. Yes. Then second best product. And also lastly, people, you know, even though you're borrowing money, people actually want to typically bank with a, a reputable household, you know. So net bank's got to be good. I want to be banking with CBA because I just like CBA. Cool. So, yeah. Right. So the the second or third tier lenders who are offering, you know, five bips as a discount, that's just not worth it because, well, I can't see it in my normal banking app. Yeah. It might not be as, I mean, the technology might be as good that, you know, might the client might already have some existing bank accounts at the, the primary lender that we're going to. So, I mean, that's not to say we, we don't go to second tier or, or, you know, the second tier to your market or the the non-bank market tomorrow yeah, yeah. because they've got some great offers and their credit policy under ASIC is much different to the ADI APRA policy. What does that mean? So we've, we've got two uh, two legislators, APRA and ASIC. Yep. Okay. APRA um, are, are policing or monitoring through you know, policy the banks who take in deposit holders' money and then lend it out. Yep. Okay. Their policy is quite different in, in some regards to the ASIC non-bank lenders who basically securitize their funding um, for for lending. So we're in that space right now where a lot of restrictions for the banks are are not in place with the non-banks and therefore we've got a lot more flexibility uh, with how we demonstrate affordability and the credit policies we can use there, which fit niches. Oh, right. So if you go to a bank and you say, I own $100,000 in shares, at a bank, you're going to have to show the share certificate and a recent valuation or something like this. Mm-hmm. And whereas a non-bank lender, you could say, I have $100,000 in shares. And then that non-bank lender goes, thanks. Is that the equivalent? Kind of. A more appropriate uh, one would be in in the banks, uh, we've got a serviceability calculator and we've got to demonstrate uh, you know, one times affordability Yep, after all of that, that coverage. And that one times might be uh, you know, a scale back of, of investment um, income, um, a scaling back of um, mutual income and things like that. In the non-bank space, we can use 100% of all of that income. And as long as there's a, a, a dollar at the end of accounting for servicing, yes. rather than a multiple of servicing, yes. we can actually lend to that person. So from a cash perspective, the non-banks have got more flexibility. As long as we can demonstrate affordability after tax that the client is not uh, going to be um, you know, out of pocket for servicing um, rather than like a debt to income ratio, like a six times or a five times, which the banks are policed with by now, yeah? Right. Okay. The, yeah. So almost different regulatory environments. Yeah. A little bit. Yeah. That's yeah. amazing. Yeah. So all these things, mate, um, that I I personally just don't have any understanding of. And it's, and it's kind of weird. And I don't know 
why historically financial planning or financial planners have have and just kind of scoped real estate out. It's and, and, and obviously like you know because of the licensing. You speak about ASIC before. I know a lot about ASIC. So, um, so you know, I think that there's always been a bit of a a worry or concern, but that's kind of largely been debunked. I would say over the last couple of years, certainly over the last decade, to a to a larger and larger extent, you've seen more financial planners get involved in the area of property and debt a lot more than traditionally. And yet, it's like anything. You you kind of by by a certain age and by a certain kind of a reputational environment that you build yourself up in, you don't necessarily want to start dipping your toe into things that you're not as good at, right? You've Correct. been working on it for the last 20 years. And so I can, I, I, I see the natural resistance to financial planners and who, who don't, who choose not to get involved in debt and, mm. and property. And that was on what I never did. Um, but I always knew it was one of those things that I should have done. So, what what would you say to or what did you say to the financial planners when when you were working at announcer and what and what do you say to them now when you work with them? Yeah, that will I guess give an advisor the confidence to get involved in this space, especially assuming, of course, um, that you're on the back end making sure that their clients get looked after. Like, how how do you do you do presentations? Like, do you have hey, this is what you should be thinking about financial plan. I think I think the you know vicariously in the old business because I was in the meetings with the the financial planners just as I was learning about you know financial planning strategies and things I'm sure the financial planners were learning about the the granular sort of policies around credit right but that being said I think it's appropriate for a financial planner to at least talk about the property and debt and from a you know a macro perspective give advice around that there's no reason why they shouldn't the granular part of you know which bank you go to, why the policies and things like that. That's an operations piece for me, and that's why Lydian is so important. You know, we've got we've got good people that you know who are supporting the operations piece. Our brokers are qualified and specialised, which is great. What we're doing is really sort of educate educating the financial planners. We're enabling the financial planners to have these stronger, more robust conversations about debt. Yep. And also they are either getting remunerated or their client is benefiting from it. So it's good. We want to make sure the clients are going to stay with them. There's this big intergenerational wealth conversation piece. So having a you know a di- bit of diversified diversification in your portfolio is important. Yep. All of those things help the financial planner. But most importantly, Lydian and our brokers are about trying to help the financial planner have stronger conversations around property and debt and then the confidence that they can refer their client through to Lydian because we've got good operations and we've got, you know, we've got very experienced mortgage brokers uh, to deliver on the promises that we've made from the advice. And and if your company, you know, if I think back to my own financial planning um, company, one of the concerns I had in terms of working with um, mortgage brokers and getting involved in debt was you never quite, like once you move across into mortgage brokering land, there's always the who owns the client. Correct. Yeah. All right. So the reason why uh, I, I think your background with working with advisors, like what kind of assurances or how do you structure the contracts or how do you provide a level of confidence to the advisor that they're not risking in any way that they're going to potentially lose their client? Yeah. Look, that that is difficult. I mean, in the contract, it you know it states that. You know that that is their client, and we're not going to sort of market and uh, prospect to those clients. Like I said before, we want to participate in the reviews, Good. so yeah. I think that that's what we would like to do. Uh, but if the financial plan doesn't want to do that, we can't force that on a on a on the business to do that. Some of the other things we're doing is is rather than just sort of sort of referring through to a mortgage broker, we are um, allowing um, larger financial planning companies who've got either operations people or relationship people in their teams who have got a bit of time, resources, and um, have got strong client relationships to participate in that transaction, whether it be from a compliance perspective, i.e. becoming the broker. You know, right. So or you can handhold. Or, or alternatively, just sort of be the operations person before it gets referred to Lydian. Right. Okay. So there's the, the two options are low low involvement from the planner's office yep. or or a high involvement. Yeah, so we can got, got that scalable um service offer. I mean some of the larger uh, financial planning firms they've got 
staff in there who are, you know, their goals are to be financial planners, some of the junior yes. guys and girls. Yes. And um, they're looking to build up their client base themselves, their age demographics. It's appropriate for them to be picking up sort of more middle-aged people than mature age people, just yep. purely for that relationship. Yes. So by adding the debt component uh, as a conversation to them and then plugging into Lydian, so they can kind of be the broker, but we've just got the operations side of it covered. That's a super interesting concept. And here's a question you probably don't know the answer to. Um, and so I'm just kind of thinking out loud, but one of the major issues with bunch of planning right now is getting younger staff through their professional year. Mm. I wonder if there's any think that they can do in terms of being involved in brokering, which would tick some of those boxes. And again, I, I don't I don't expect no. you to be able to answer that question. Something I might um I might see if I can spend a bit of time getting my head around. Yeah, cool. I, I mean, that's something that we've just sort of started to explore this year. So the last couple of t- two years has really been building up the partnerships that we've you know you mentioned before a couple of big national ones, but um you know most appropriately we're just looking at smaller uh, financial planning firms who don't have the capability or or want to do mortgage broking in-house, Yep, and they plug into us. But what we're we're also finding is a lot of larger businesses who do mortgage broking, they may have the broker, but these financial planning businesses are specialist at operations for financial planners. That's right. They don't give any operation support to their mortgage broking, right? So when I delay like the unloved cousin on the yeah. Yeah. So when I talk before about (laughs) ten hours to process a loan, that's not I'm not messing around. So that poor mortgage broker has got to do the relationships and give a high um, client experience to their person, right? Plus do the data entry, file hygiene, maintain compliance. The the business owner is thinking, well, I've got this great mortgage broking business, but it's not supported by the same operational excellence right. to the financial plan. Also, you might actually be using financial planners or even potentially even brokers. And pr- and plugging in a back office to them, yeah, kind of, yeah, kind of, yeah. So that's the VBP thing, right? Yeah, um, the Lydian thing is is uh, potentially we have that, you know, we place that broker in that group, which otherwise it'd be too hard to build out this, you know, this ecosystem. Yeah, you know, balls broken, yeah, yeah. So anyway, look, I mean, we're two years in, and we've got definitely got the maturity in the operations space now, which has been our primary goal. You know, we've got guys and girls over in the in Cebu in the Philippines. Yeah, you know, they processed so many applications. Uh, with so many different lenders, their credit knowledge is huge. Yeah. And we've got three or four guys now or girls um, who are almost at that credit analyst perspective. So you can you know, give them the data. They could sit through the different policies and things. Yeah. And they could recommend the product. Not that they you know, provide the advice to clients, but they can certainly do all of that, you know, that paper movement and things. And that means that our brokers then have a lot more free time to one, you know, handhold the clients, two, yeah. seek other partnerships, three, participate in our partnerships. Yes. Um and yeah, basically specialised being in sales and advice, um, and that's an uncomfortable space for mortgage brokers to be in because typically they've all been beholden on the operations process, yes. and the transaction process, and that's what we're trying to do is liberate the brokers a little bit to go right. Well, I've got all this free time now; I can look after so many more clients. That's awesome. That's awesome, Booth mate. I really hope because we didn't even get a chance to to get into all of this knowledge that you've built up over the years in terms of uh, what you do know about specifics, in terms of how to take um, someone like me who doesn't know a lot about property and debt and inform them um, over the course of a period of time. So, mate, this has been an awesome podcast in terms that I hope it is only the first of many. So, mate, thank you for coming on. Thank you, Clayton, very much.